in listen-only mode. Okay, Brad, we should be good. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Adams with the Tennessee chapter of HFMA, welcoming you back for week three of our CHFP uh, webinar series. Uh, so hopefully uh, everyone's been able to make it on today. I know a lot of school systems are probably out for spring break, especially based on the numbers where a few fewer people showing up live today than we had the last couple of weeks. Um, before I turn it over to Christoph, a couple of housekeeping items. If you've got questions as we go along through the webinar, uh, please submit those through the questions box, um, and then you know our fine moderators will be monitoring monitoring those, of course, and uh, getting back to you or passing them off to Kristoff uh, as well um, so that he can answer them live through our webinar here. Um, we will be having polling questions as usual throughout the course of the webinar. And please remember that uh, your ability to earn CPE is directly tied to the polling questions. You need to respond to the polling questions in order to receive your CPE certificate for this. Um, so when those pop up, even if you don't know the answer, just submit something. That way we know you're paying attention. Um, and that, that, of course, is a requirement from NASBA that we do these things. Uh, so today you'll be hearing, um, doing the polling questions and helping Christoph with questions, is going to be Chris Johnson. And Chris is a member from the North Carolina chapter. Um, so this is pretty great uh, that we've expanded this out past Region 5 now and included so many other chapters this year. Um, and as usual, Martha Calfee is on the line to help back everybody up and make sure things uh, go well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Christoph. Brad, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, for being there to help out. And Martha, of course, in the background. And Shannon Ebenkamp is on as an organizer today also. I hope your day is going well. I uh, am thrilled to be with, back with you today to talk about the revenue cycle. This is a topic that uh, covers approximately a quarter of the exam. So out of the six knowledge areas, this gets weighted uh, heavily. It is not an exam uh, like the CRCR exam, uh, which is the uh, certified revenue cycle uh, credential. Uh, which goes uh, deeply into the weeds. Uh, this is uh, more high level than the other certification exam that HFMA offers, and um, yet it, it goes deep enough uh, that uh, one of our CFOs in Oregon, uh, a very wonderful man who is currently our president, who has served on various national task forces, took the, um, the old revenue cycle specialty exam and didn't pass it and uh, made no bones about uh, being glad that he didn't pass. He said there ought to be some things that I don't know that uh, other people in the organization know. So this exam does require some attention uh, from everyone in order to, uh, to uh, pass the revenue cycle uh, portion of it as well. And, and you know you don't have to pass a portion, but you need to get 7% of all questions correct in order to pass. So how are we going to go about talking about the revenue cycle? We're basically going to follow the same uh, process we have. And uh, unfortunately, the case studies, insofar as we do them, are going to be somewhat one-sided from me doing them. But uh, we have polling questions. We have eight polling questions for you to vote on and another two polling questions uh, uh, to talk about outside the polling mechanism. The topic of the revenue cycle is one that uh, we have to, or I have to, triangulate a little bit about. Uh, we can talk about um, some of the things that I know on the exam and uh, just hope that by talking about those and then uh, kind of taking a compass reading on the whole revenue cycle that we cover enough material to cover everything that is asked. So there's a little bit of triangulation going on here, which is different from webinars one and two, where 
the focus very clearly was on quantitative stuff that we know is tested in uh, financial reporting and in budgeting and forecasting. And then next week we uh, we're, we're back to a more uh, orderly course with the remaining subjects. So when you open the online study guide uh, and uh, you see that the revenue cycle is in two parts. Uh, part one is two hours and I think part one, two is two is one hour. So it also covers a great deal of time in the online study guide. It opens right off with the diagram such as you see here on the screen. I'm not doing so well here to move this in the middle. I can't try it this way. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, a diagram which makes the revenue cycle look like a, kind of a spaghetti chart of sorts. Uh, everything pointing to the middle of it and uh, um, the, the other things surrounding it are a bunch of functions that most of us can identify by name and know a little bit about. I find this um, approach to be uh, less um, uh, useful for learning about the re revenue cycle. So what I'm going to do instead is uh, go and use a process view of the revenue cycle. Oh, trouble here with my with my size, and that by, by process cycle or by process view, I mean a diagram like this. I'm sure you have seen something like this somewhere in your career. There's this no no uh, originality here showing you the revenue cycle like this. But by looking at the processes uh, kind of lined up like ducks in a row, we are more likely to capture the big picture and when we go into more detail know where we are on the map. So the first half of today's webinar is going to be devoted to process. That's part of the triangulation. The other part of the triangulation is a deeper dive into Medicare, particularly the three main payment systems of Medicare, the uh, um, inpatient prospective payment system or IPPS, the outpatient system OPPS, and then the Medicare physician fee schedule, all three topics that are that show up on the exam. But before we go there, we're going to take a little bit of a look at process here. And you see that you have a front end, you have something called the middle or patient care, I suppose, and then the back end. Uh, if you want to learn more about each of these functions, where do you go? Well, several I, uh, ways that I can help you go about that. Number one, I have in the appendix, and we haven't really done anything with the appendix to the book at this point, uh, three articles uh, about the revenue cycle. They are not new. The oldest one of them is from 2003. Uh, but I, I just like these three articles because they give a very nice view of what the language, the vocabulary is that revenue cycle people use and how they, how they communicate and also what it is they are focused on when they measure and improve. So for those of you who are um, interested in exploring the back of the book, the nine articles back there, the first three on the revenue cycle are only 25 pages and uh, they make a good thing to glance over uh, and see if there's something useful there for you. The, the term revenue cycle comes out of the uh, public accounting world. The revenue cycle uh, consists of the functions, the, 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 um, the the, the revenue generating functions of an organization, not specific to healthcare, and in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, the term revenue cycle has been applied to all of these uh, pipeline uh, tasks that you see here. Before that, you simply talked about admitting and medical records and the business office, and you didn't really see them as, uh, as a unit like you do here on this diagram. So the term revenue cycle is something new and as uh, the hurdles have uh, gone higher and higher for getting paid, so has the attention paid to the revenue cycle and uh, it, it now uh, takes up a very, has a very prominent place 
in, in the uh, universe of healthcare financial management. So how do we go about talking about the revenue cycle? There's uh, different opportunities in the revenue cycle. Uh, these come from the articles in the back. I'm sure you can list others, and we're not going to spend any time on them here, but that's certainly one way to come about it is to say, where can we improve things? Uh, also from the articles in the back are uh, some leading revenue cycle practices. They were leading in the time they still are, and I just list them here to uh, basically give another view of what kinds of things we look at in the revenue cycle. Things can go wrong in the revenue cycle all over the place. Uh, this is a list of pathologies, so to speak, that uh, hinder us from getting paid or getting paid the right amount. Um, something like this could show up on the exam as, a, you know, which of the following uh, are uh, attributable, say, to uh, errors made in registration or admitting. Uh, so other than that, I'm not sure this list is is particularly useful. Before we go into our case study, which is right here, I want to uh, take you through a little bit through the study guide, because there's a wealth of information here that um, will help us understand the revenue cycle. And here's the diagram again, and so here are the uh, description of the articles. Here's that list of things that can go wrong. Before we talk about coding, which is kind of a deep dive, I want to go here first. This is page 63. Now, uh, all of you will be familiar with uh, David Hammer. He's a member of the Florida HFMA chapter. Wonderful man, very prominent uh, contributor to uh, healthcare financial management in many different ways. He published, he did a field study. Uh, in the middle 2000s and published his findings in July 2007 in this seminal article, which unfortunately no longer is on the HFMA website. If you want a copy of this, I can send you what I have. This is just a wonderful um, collection of information that David put together where he looked at uh, key revenue cycle performance indicators and standards, or KPIs. He just simply asked people, what, what do you do and what constitutes good behavior and, and good results and good performance? So the idea in showing this to you is not for you to memorize lists or to memorize what good performance is, but you might uh, well find it useful to consult a list like this. And that's where we cut over from uh, um, very bare bones exam preparation to using this information in your workplace, which is after all the whole idea behind certification is that you practice the things that, uh, that you learn in preparing for the exam and that you have some fun with this stuff. So he, here are some of these uh, standards. And then, I'm just scrolling through this, you can look at these on your own. And then he has a checklist, do you or have you. And uh, again, the idea here is <clears throat> in this process of triangulation, just to put some meat around this uh, process diagram, which I showed you, this one right here. So that, and, and he organized, David organized uh, his uh, material in such a way that you see he's got scheduling, insurance, verification, financial counseling. He's got some of these, these high-level uh, functions identified for us already in this article. So that's the, my intent in showing this to you. And uh, I'm happy to send this to Brad to post on the website. And I'm going to make myself a note to do that so I don't forget to send this to Brad after today, after our, the end of our webinar today. So I don't mean to uh, make you dizzy by showing you what's on each of these screens. Now let's talk about what HFMA has since done with, uh, with this work that David started. I'm going to skip this and go here. Uh, HFMA in, in 2010 got together a group of uh, 
uh, revenue cycle experts, leaders really in HFMA who work in the re revenue cycle, locked them into a room and said, guys, uh, what are the things that you measure and how do you measure them? And let's all agree on one way to measure them. And this group did, and they published a list of 25, I think they're 25 uh, indicators. They're called MAP keys. And MAP stands for Measure, Analyze, and Improve, or something like that. I'm not even sure yet myself. And I have the, the name of the definition. It stands for Measure, Apply, Perform. OK, Measure Performance, Apply Evidence-Based Strategies for Improvement, and Perform to the highest standards across the board. So there are these keys or, or formulas. They look like ratio formulas, uh, heaven forbid, that uh, we in HFMA have agreed to use and measure uh, our performance in a uniform way. So this is a huge service to our industry that HFMA and its volunteers have performed. And uh, it, there's more to it than that. There is a map application. It's a, a web-based piece of software that HFMA has uh, developed and that you can subscribe to. I don't know what it costs. Uh, you then feed your data into this application, which if may crunches the numbers and normalizes them for you, and then uh, identifies peers that are like you, so that if you want to benchmark yourself against someone, you're doing that in an accurate and uh, meaningful way against others like you. So all of this is the MAP initiative. There's an award that goes with it. Uh, that is, um, I think, announced at a MAP event once a year. And then at the ANI, the MAP winners are, are further recognized. So that's what this event is all about. And you see there are 25 hospitals, and then there are some physician practice MAP keys as well. I have all of these in your book. Here they start. And uh, the reason for me putting them here is not for you now to further um, muddle your head with the ratio formulas. The intent here is to just show you how you, in a standard way, measure performance. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about the three different metrics here that I particularly think are important. They're all important, but I particularly like uh, uh, three of them. And uh, I'm going to start with this one right here. Days in total discharge, not final build, or DMFE. That's a, a set of initials you frequently encounter in the revenue cycle. This um, uh, metric measures the amount of uh, uh, money or amount of receivables that sit in the in the never-never land between discharge or the uh, completion of service for an outpatient and the moment uh, the account is built out of the uh, host computer system. So everything that happens in charge generation that hasn't happened up to this point, uh, that happens in coding and documentation completion by physicians, uh, is, uh, is what sits in that interval. It's basically kind of the bend right around here in between patient care. The patient care has ended. We're going now to the HIM, or health information management uh, bucket here, which is where the coders work. But the doctors have to do a bunch of stuff. And also, we're still waiting for some charges to trickle in. So this is this DNFB is an important way to measure uh, that particular bucket. Now, there's another piece of it. And that is uh, this one right here, total discharge not submitted to payer. It is essentially everything uh, uh, that, it, it, that is sitting here in DNFB plus also this bucket here called FBNS. I know this is a bunch of acronyms here. FBNS, here's the formula for FBNS. It's what the main computer has spit out, but that hasn't left the facility yet because the billing folks are still editing the claim. And it's only after this account that apparently is already billed, that that's what our main computer system is telling us, uh, um, but really hasn't gone out the door. It's not until that someone presses the submit button 
token and the, uh, um, the batch of claims goes to the clearinghouse that this final bill not submitted to payer uh, evidence. And you put the two of them together, the DNFB and this final bill not submitted, and that gives you this category called days not submitted, days in total discharge not submitted to payer. So that's simply the total of the other two. And notice that I developed here, and we will not have to now go through this, I developed yesterday evening a, um, a question here that uh, is totally Christos fabrication, not sure something like this would show up, uh, but the answer is DNSB, A is the right answer, consists of discharge not final build plus final build not submitted. This is a, a key trick of the trade in managing receivables and that's why I mention it here. Back to these formulas, I think uh, there's enough said about them at this point. So uh, use them, enjoy them, but uh, do no more with them. Okay, so I want to um, show you some other information here. This is something brand new. Uh, I just developed this last week, and I will make sure that you get this also. Put this on my list as well. This uh, is something that I feel was missing from this practicum, because uh, while I, in these webinars, talk about the, these various buckets, I've never really, even in my own mind, laid out what the actual workflow is and what happens where. So the hospital information system is the, the EPIC system or the uh, McKesson system or the Cerner system, whatever, that produces the claim. And uh, it goes to, this is where DNFB, or discharge not final billing, build, sits where um, a claim sits out there for a, a number of days until it passes a, a certain kind of simple edits that simply say, do I have a diagnosis, do I have uh, a DRG assignment, and so forth, for instance, in which case it goes from unbuilt to build and goes to the claim scrubber. Now, claim scrubber is the next step. This is where the uh, next bucket sits of uh, claims that are out of the billing system but haven't gone out the door yet. And uh, claim scrubbers, I describe them here for those who uh, wonder if this is some kind of a, a, a cleaning uh, product that you buy in the uh, uh, grocery store that washes claims. No, it's an editing system. Basically, what it looks like is uh, uh, claims that have problems show up uh, looking just like a claim on a biller screen and the, f the, uh, the data elements or fields on the claim that have errors in them blink or, or, or appear in, a, in red and then the biller uh, goes and fixes them. Uh, and then once the claims are clean, the clearinghouse is ready to accept them. That happens several times a day. It then goes to the clearinghouse and what exactly is a clearinghouse? I'm trying to define that for you here and also um, explain what a clearinghouse does. It's essentially a conduit that uh, uh, links the providers to the payers through a single pipeline and uh, in the other direction it works the same way. So if a payer sends something electronically to a provider, they generally do that through a clearinghouse. The nice thing about this is that uh, a, a provider doesn't have to go into a uh, hundred different mailboxes every morning and pull out uh, uh, the, the claims traffic uh, that has arrived uh, overnight and uh, similarly the, they also don't have to send claims to a hundred different, hundred different addresses. That's all handled by the clearinghouse. Now on the right here I show you then specifically what happens in the Medicare world. Again, this is something that uh, someone who speaks the language of PFS knows very well, but the rest of Chris, us, yes? Chris, and this is Chris. Um, we have a question. Go ahead. Um, the flow chart, but Martha may have answered it. I wasn't sure. The, the flow chart that you're looking at, is that in the material? No, it is not. What okay. I was just saying is I just developed this last week. Okay. And I will send it out to you so you can add it uh, anywhere you want it to the book. So that's coming to you after today's webinar. 
Perfect. Okay. Randall, you're the first group that I have shared this with. Wonderful. Okay, so that's how this works. It also explains a little bit what RTP is, what uh, um, an ADR is, and, and what CWF is. There's more on this in all of these acronyms in the uh, section of the book called the Revenue Cycle Primer, uh, and I'm just going to quickly go there to show show it to you. There's this section here that starts on page 97. There is everything you want to know and didn't want to know about uh, uh, Medicare, and it goes into some detail uh, and is intended as a reference section for you if you are not very familiar with the revenue cycle. And putting this together, I learned a lot myself, and I work in the revenue cycle myself. So it's uh, my intent. My intent here is to, as precisely as possible, define something for you so that you can speak confidently about uh, uh, these various processes in the revenue cycle. Okay. So with that, I'm going to go back here and uh, introduce uh, some other process-related topics. I'm going to go back to my diagram right here, this one right here. Um, excuse me for a minute. My, our one cat is murdering the other cat, and I, I am going to have to intervene here. I'll be right back. <coughs> And I'm back. I have three daughters, and uh, um, they're all grown, and we still have the legacy cat from our oldest 29-year-old daughter. This cat is 17 years old, has had a stroke, and uh, is quite immobile. And uh, our middle daughter is living with us presently, and she has a, a newer cat, and this new cat uh, uh, um, tortures this uh, old, uh, poor, this poor old cat. So I'm not sure intervening makes any difference, but at least I, I can say I tried. Okay, so um, we have uh, in the revenue cycle uh, scheduling events, pre-registration. We've talked about some of these things. I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive right now into this box right here called Health Information Management. And then we will do the case study, and then we will, uh, in the second half, of today talk about Medicare. So let's go and look at what happens in this box, which is uh, perhaps the greatest mystery to some of us. And I want to take us to page 59 in your book, which is kind of a deep dive into that particular area. And I talk here about coding systems. This is uh, relevant to the exam, otherwise why would we be talking about this? And we're not ready for polling questions yet, Chris, I, uh, although we're half an hour into this because we need to get a little bit farther before we can do our first polling questions. So here okay. is a, um, uh, a three-page uh, precise summary, as precise as I know how to make it, talking about coding. Uh, what is coding? It's a translation of clinical information into computer-readable language. So you're taking narrative information that used to be on charts, and these days it's in electronic records, uh, and translated into uh, alphanumeric codes that a computer can process, uh, measure quality from, and pay of. And so what are the different systems that we use? Well, on the... Uh, um, the, the two main systems, ICD and uh, CPT. The ICD system is a little bit complicated because it does more than one thing. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me tell you, it's an old thing. It's been around. Its origins go back into the late 19th century when a French uh, doctor started classifying diseases. This is still in the colonial age. And uh, out of this has come a book uh, uh, that classifies diseases, injuries, and causes of death. It, it's a pretty grim thing to read. 
if you've ever looked at an ICD-9 book, it's uh, it, uh, kind of depressing to see what, what can go wrong with the human body. This book has uh, uh, been clinically modified. That's what the CM initials behind uh, the ICD-9 and also a portion of the ICD-10 system stand for. It's been adapted to be used by by healthcare providers, and it's an international system. Uh, we are about to implement the 10th version of it, or 10th edition in October, which was pushed back a, a year, but you see uh, the 11th edition is already out there in draft as well. So who maintains this thing today? It's the National Center for Health Statistics, and here's the, the clincher. It is used both for diagnosis information, which is really what the ICD or the World Health Organization's use of this book is, or what this doctor in France intended it to be used for, but it is also used to code inpatient procedures. Uh, all of this was uh, buried in, in ICD-9, CM, and uh, you could only tell by the way the code looked how many digits it had. Uh, whether it was a diagnosis code or an inpatient procedure code. But what has since happened is that we have run out of space in this book. As, as healthcare has gotten more uh, complicated, so we have added so much more to the book uh, that, that it has uh, um, kind of reached its limits. It's kind of like a, as if the Library of Congress system ran out of numbers or the Dewey Decimal System ran out of numbers and letters to uh, classify and categorize books. So we have now gone to implement this ICD T10 system. And what helps us there a little bit is that we now distinguish by name between the piece of it that has to do with diagnoses, which is called ICD 10 CM or clinically the clinical modification piece of it, and then ICD-9, ICD-10 PCS, which is the inpatient procedure part of it. Uh, there's a, a great deal of expansion going on in, in these systems, and uh, so it's much more versatile than what, uh, with room, room to grow in addition. So here are some examples of what some of these codes look like. Here is a diagnosis code. You see it has three digits digits, then a decimal uh, a point, and a one digit in this case after the decimal. It can have more than one digits after the decimal. Here's a procedure code, which is a two-digit code. That's the way uh, codes currently um, can be distinguished. You see in the ICD-10 world, you get uh, all kinds of code combinations that no one's going to be able to remember. And uh, that means you're going to have to use an encoder. And what is an encoder? This brings us back to talking a little bit about a box like this. An encoder is a piece of software that a coder uses to uh, turn documentation into codes. It's kind of like a code finder software in a way that uh, uh, helps uh, make, that suggests what uh, a code might be or asks the relevant questions to lead you to the right answer. So that's what uh, is, uh, is about to happen, and everyone's busy getting ready for that. The second coding system is the CPT coding system. That stands for, for Clinical Procedural Te Terminology. It's the fourth edition. Uh, it's proprietary to the American Medical Association. That's why when you go on to a CMS, VA CMS website or the website of uh, a Medicare administrative contractor or many other organizations that, that make use of CPT codes, you always have to accept the license terms. The CMS is one of the licensees of this system, uh, and they have been since 1983, and they uh, have essentially renamed uh, uh, the system for their purposes, the Healthcare Procedural Coding System, abbreviated as HCPCS. So this system catalogs everything that doctors do, whether it is in an out uh, clinic setting, uh, office visits and procedure, procedures, or if it is in, in the hospital, you know, the, the, this could also be a hospital visit, and certainly hospital outpatient procedures. 
all of that is uh, the domain of the CPT4 or HICPIX system. Now there's more to it in that Medicare or CMS has added to it. The original CPT4 book and still to this day, as I said, is everything a doctor does. Uh, we, uh, that is what uh, Medicare calls uh, level one uh, of HICPIX. It's essentially copy-paste the entire uh, CPT4 book and rename it, keeping all of the naming conventions, everything the same. That's what HICPIX level one is. Level two adds some stuff to it. And here is a, a list of what it adds to it. It adds, uh, doctors don't drive ambulances, so that got added. Uh, medical devices have HICPIX codes, so do drugs and supplies. And then there, there are some things that doctors do, but they, they are specific to Medicare, so they wouldn't be in the CPT4 book, but they are going to be in the HICPIX book level 2. And that is, for instance, Medicare flu shots or welcome to uh, Medicare exams or annual wellness exams. They are uh, codes in the HICPIX book now as well. And these HICPIX codes look different. Uh, the CPT codes all look like this. They're uh, five uh, numeric, uh, f five numbers, a numeric entirely. Uh, HICPIX level two codes are alphanumeric, and so are these uh, level three codes. And the level three codes, you don't really need to know or remember what they are. They are local or state level codes tied to local coverage determinations. We'll talk a little bit about LCDs or local coverage uh, determinations in a moment, but you don't really need to know about this level three and what's in it and why is it in level three and so forth. Now, as if this were enough, it's not. There are also modifiers used that add uh, a suffix of two digits to a HICPIX or CPT code to uh, further uh, define the service that was rendered. You can read about this in this Medicare Primer uh, section that I pointed uh, out to you a little while ago. There's more about modifiers and the effect they have on payment and uh, what it is they what it is they tell a, a reader about the service that was provided. Now, one of the reasons the ICD-10 system is so large is that it incorporates um, accident codes or e-codes that otherwise have uh, live outside of the ICD-9-CM system. So these are external causes of injury that were or still are uh, communicated separately from the ICD-9 diagnosis system, and they are now being incorporated in ICD-10 into the new coding structure. That is a, probably accounts for, uh, I don't know, some of you in the audience might know what percent of the increase in diagnosis codes is simply the uh, addition of the cause of the, the injury uh, that is specified in the code. And here are some examples of existing ICD-9 e-codes. Railway accident involving explosion, fire, or burning, accident to spacecraft, etc. And then you see these codes, the, these things then get incorporated into the ICD-10 uh, coding structure, but they permit then all kinds of very unlikely uh, events from being coded. So there's a little bit of humor in healthcare after all. So that's how uh, that works. And NV codes are another subset of ICD-9 CM codes that are called supplementary, supplementary classification of factors influencing health status and contact with health services. They uh, continue to live in ICD-10. Here are some examples of some of what these codes are. And they are typically also used uh, uh, frequently. Some of them are used with labs, like uh, doctor orders at the lab. Uh, uh, that uh, diagnosis code on the order might simply have a V70 or general medical exam or screening exam on it. All right.
right. So that's what the coding system is. And then what I added here on the last page is a discussion of the difference between inpatient coding and outpatient coding and what it is you can or cannot do in each of these worlds. The inpatient coding world is more complicated. It is typically reserved to the best educated coders, uh, people in many cases who went to college to become an RHIA, someone who uh, has a bachelor's degree in, in coding and, and medical records or HIM. Uh, there are a number of certifications in, in coding uh, that you may also be aware of by different organizations. So this is an interesting discussion of how inpatient coding is different from outpatient coding. Uh, it, it's an area where I'm treading myself a little bit on thin ice because I don't, I'm not a coder, I don't know this stuff, but uh, I run across it frequently enough that I felt it important to describe here in the book. So there, there it is for you if you choose to take a look at it. Now deep diving into another box here, and I'll show you which box we're now talking about. It's this one right here. So we've just gone from HIM, we skipped over these two boxes here, and, and we now find ourselves here in denial processing, billing and collections, I suppose, if I, I wanted to be coy about it, would say we covered a little bit in, in this diagram that I'm going to send you after today's webinar, this diagram not being in your book. So let's talk about the yes, Chris. Um, just one. We have a question um, that I, um, that I think probably you could address better. The question is: Will we be tested on general knowledge or very specific questions, such as what does modifier twenty six mean or status code S versus T? Uh, you will not be tested on what a modifier means and what a status indicator is. No, you will not be. Um, at all. So the thing to mainly know what do modifiers do rather than what a specific modifier or status indicator is. Okay, great. Good question. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that forward. Okay, now we're talking about denial management. This is a little bit of a deep dive here also. What I'm using here is something that I found a long time ago in the HFMA magazine and I also feel this is unsurpassed as a, uh, an overview over what goes wrong in, on the denial side and, 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 uh, and, and who works it and who clears it up. I think it makes sense to distinguish between provider errors, which can be clinical or technical administrative, and then also payer errors where the payer is making a mistake. And uh, I would consider an underpayment just as much a denial as as a provider caused clinical or technical administrative denial. So just take a look at this list. There's basically four main uh, clinical things that can go wrong. We will cover and talk in more specific, uh, specificity about this one right here and this one in just a moment. Uh, these here are the kinds of things that can go wrong generally in admitting or scheduling that we don't have the subscriber number correctly and the provider says I don't know who this is not one of our people where a service wasn't authorized where an attempt was made to authorize or notify but it wasn't done in a timely manner where we uh, happen to have uh, missed something when we verified benefits or even verified them at all uh, coverage terminated can happen to you if someone doesn't pay their premium or switch plans and you don't know about it. Other insurance could be prime. In other words, you didn't verify uh, the, the sequence insurance correctly or this is a favorite one. You're making the same mistake again and you're just sending a duplicate claim without having somehow indicated that this is a correction to a prior, a prior claim. Timely filing. Why is this uh, uh, so important? When uh, uh, most payers need to know what it is they need to pay out in claims. We will talk about that next week when we talk about uh, contract management. There's such a thing as 
incurred but not reported, IBNR. That's a category of, uh, it's an estimate of claims that a payer is obligated to pay, but they may not have received the claim form yet, and it's their year, and they need to report their uh, performance indicator, their operating uh, uh, income, and they can't because they may, there may still be claims out there that, that they need to process and pay for the last fiscal year. So payers have imposed uh, very strict timely filing limits, uh, in, and, and so has CMS. Uh, so that uh, um, providers are forced to bill claims faster and quicker than they otherwise would. Uh, these reasons here in the middle of these, oops, I can't really seem to highlight them, these technical administrative reasons, this list of maybe, I don't know how many these are, somewhere between 15 and 20, I didn't count them, this is kind of the classic uh, grouping of these technical administrative uh, denial reasons, there are hundreds of codes, literally hundreds of codes. Medicare alone has uh, close to 200 uh, uh, remittance code uh, codes that they use on their remittances, and then you multiply that by uh, uh, the number of payers you have. This is a way to standardize that kind of a reporting and stick them all, the like, uh, IELTS all together under these headings. So that's the best practice right here to do something like this. And underpayments, we've already, I've already mentioned here are some of the things that can go wrong, and uh, it's a good idea to make sure that you're paying, being paid correctly. Then down here, I'm saying who it is that is responsible for working the denial. So uh, I'm going to you see my material is, reor is organized a little bit differently. I'm going to skip David Hammer section again in the map keys and now go to what here is called the Medicare section, um, about which we're going to talk some more in a minute. But I want to talk about some specific features here that have to do with medical necessity. Before we go there, um, yeah, having to do with medical necessity. So right now, in terms of where we are here on this diagram, we are uh, kind of up here in this in this area, here where I'm circling in this front end. Okay, um, and uh, let me describe how that is. Uh, Medicare doesn't want to pay, and no payer wants to pay for something that that uh, goes against the common rules of medical necessity. In other words, where a doctor wants to do something that he or she shouldn't do because it, 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 there's no clinical benefit to it. And uh, what Medicare has done is very simply define medical necessity as a, a set of code pairs that either fit together or don't fit together. They do that by publishing lists of ICD-9 diagnosis codes, soon to be ICD-10 diagnosis codes, and pairing them with all kinds of CPT or HIPPITS codes that don't fit together. So these pairs are then excluded from coverage. They are, they're denied, they're paid as medically unnecessary. Uh, the way that works in in admitting here or scheduling here somewhere in this arena up front is that if a patient shows up with a written order uh, in hand and hands it to the lab clerk saying the doctor sent me to have this lab test done, what this uh, lab clerk should do, or if it's not a lab clerk then someone registering this patient, is run that code pair from the uh, written lab order through a computer system that says, okay, do this diagnosis code and this lab code go together. The same in radiology, do the, does this diagnosis code and this MRI or scan or uh, image go uh, together, do they make sense? And if it doesn't, then you simply say to the patient, no, this doesn't make sense. Um, you call the doctor say, did you make a mistake? And uh, um, so there's a conversation going on about that. If the doctor says, no, I told the patient 
that they should have this test done and to, to heck with uh, uh, CMS's uh, medical necessity rules, I still think this patient needs it, then the provider needs to issue what is called a advanced beneficiary notice. Note the words, and this, this is a concept you need to know for the exam. It's, again, let's look at it word by word. It's in advance. It's done up front. Beneficiary is what Medicare calls patients. They're not patients. They're beneficiaries. And notice, it's a notice. You're giving the beneficiary something ahead of time. And what you're telling the patient is the doctor wants to do something. Uh, it doesn't meet medical necessity guidelines. Do you want to proceed and have it done? If yes, sign here. If no, sign there. Yes means you, we can bill you for it and you're obligated to pay it. No means that uh, uh, we're not going to be able to do this test for you today. Sorry. So that's what an ABN is. It's a waiver, essentially. There's one also for inpatient services. That's called a hospital-issued notice of non-coverage. That would be issued when a patient is staying in the hospital for social reasons. There's no place for the patient to go. The patient is ready to be discharged, wants to stay, refuses to leave. You give them a notice of non-coverage, which means that uh, the patient then becomes financially obligated to pay uh, for those kinds of services. So that's what outpatient medical necessity is. I've already basically described it. Here is a table, an example for what uh, in Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska is considered a, a legitimate combination of a DEXA scan with ICD-9 diagnosis codes. This is called a local coverage determination. In other words, this table is only valid for Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. Why is it those four states? I don't know. Uh, those four states each have uh, medical review organizations that basically sat down and said, okay, here are the things that are valid diagnoses to do a DEXA scan for. And uh, probably, in, and insofar as uh, there's a universal or, uh, yeah, universal agreement on on a table like this, it then gets elevated from a local coverage determination that is for one state or a few states into a national coverage determination that, that uh, uh, is in effect nationally. So that's how that works. On the outpatient side, works a little bit differently. Here, by the way, is uh, an excerpt from an NDC for MRI. It's interesting to see, it tells you what an MRI is, and then it also tells, shows you over time how coverage for MRIs has expanded from 1985 when MRIs were still relatively new to 1994, and then to 2010, uh, these uh, NCDs get expanded as new methodologies and new methods for diagnoses are developed. Uh, inpatient medical necessity doesn't have to do with uh, code pairs. It's more complicated. It generally has to do with appropriateness of admission and levels of care. Uh, I know little about this, so I can't really speak very well. I've tried my best to summarize it and tell you that typically hospital uh, uh, um, admitting nurses or utilization review departments use a tool called Interqual or something from Milliman and Robertson which tell them exactly when is an inpatient admission uh, uh, called for, when is it medically necessary, and if doctors admit patients outside of these rules, they're likely to get themselves in trouble with their peers, the medical staff review committees at a hospital or even a state level peer review organization. So it's here just so you know a little bit about it and then I'm also giving you the text here of an NCD having to do with an inpatient procedure. In this case it's an adult liver transplantation and again you see how the rules have changed over time and how 
uh, more and more uh, specificity and a wider uh, application of uh, liver transplantation is explained and, and authorized. Okay, so that's that. And then I told you earlier that one of the pathologies in the revenue cycle is that, uh, we have to go to the pathologies here, that, um, oh, hang on a second, that sometimes uh, it's unclear who is, who is primary, who is uh, the primary payer. And uh, let me see, let me see this here. It's, it, it falls under this topic of insurance verification eligibility. And uh, I know I someplace have that saying something that Medicare is not the primary payer. OK, so there are rules that govern the coordination of benefits. We'll talk about that um, again next week. And <clears throat> Medicare wants to leap from behind. I don't blame them as a taxpayer. I don't blame them for doing them. Medicare doesn't want to pay unless Medicare has to pay. So if a patient has Medicare but is flipping hamburgers at McDonald's or the spouses and is receiving uh, insurance benefits in the private market, then Medicare doesn't want to be the first to pay. So here are some of the rules that uh, govern uh, when Medicare is not going to want to pay first. If it's an accident, for instance, uh, or uh, um, if there's other group health insurance coverage, those are two of the reasons. Or if it's a workers' comp claim where Medicare says, sign me up, but don't bill me until the first payer has paid. So that's what the Medicare secondary payer uh, uh, <clears throat> questionnaire is all about, which is integrated into the admitting stream. And I know we're skipping around here a little bit, but we're talking right now about something that takes place here, probably here in this box, where that those kinds of questions get asked, or maybe here under pre-registration, which is really where it should happen upstream, as far upstream as possible. OK, so that's uh, we're one hour into this. And that's uh, the process view so far of the revenue cycle. So before we move on to the Medicare side of things, I want to stop and see, Chris, if there are any questions. Not, um, not any additional ones, Christoph, that we haven't covered as we've gone through it. OK, very good. Then let me explain the case study. And what I will do is send you the uh, spreadsheet for this as well, all right? The case study is as follows. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Here, the case study is as follows. I will just describe it. We will not do this case study here. It's also described in your book. OK, HFMA Community Hospital in Hawaii. You are the new CFO, the one who uh, was analyzing the ratios just uh, just a little a few weeks ago. You're now uh, uh, the CFO at in Honolulu at, at the HFMA hospital, and uh, you your goal is to make the hospital's revenue cycle the best it can be. And you actually have a, an idea to apply for a MAP award down the line, and so you've pulled uh, your leadership team together and you're sipping uh, 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 non-alcoholic Mai Tais and eating macadamia nuts overlooking uh, Waikiki Beach at, uh, at the uh, Diamond Head Country Club. And uh, there's lots of uh, whiteboards on the walls and lots of uh, pieces of paper to brainstorm on and, and write ideas and uh, document parking lot issues and so forth. So it's, a, it's essentially a whiteboard exercise to say, what if we design our own best practice revenue cycle. So let's create this kind of a map for ourselves and then specify what we want to do when so that when we go about redesigning our system, we end up with uh, the kind of uh, revenue cycle that we envision. So the exercise works as follows. You have essentially a, a spreadsheet uh, this is how I have adapted this exercise for purposes of teaching it, where you can put in anything you want to here on the left in any of these boxes. 
and then it displays the content on the right in these columns one to nine. So rather than uh, uh, have an unlimited number of boxes, you see right here, there's four uh, front end boxes, there's four in the middle, and then there's five at the end. Uh, artificially, I'm limiting, or I have to, for uh, reasons of space, limiting myself to nine boxes. And uh, let me just put some numbers in here. I put a two in here. Yeah, I get front end service. Good. So these first four columns are going to be the space where I record my front end functions. Here is where I'm going to put my middle. Whoops, sorry. I want to put my middle. In here, I think that's a three, and I'll show you why it is a three. Yep. And then over here in, in this box over here, uh, this merge box, columns is six to nine, I'm going to put a one in there, hit enter, and it says back end process. So that's the, the, the space we have as we develop our um, new revenue cycle blueprint here. And then here, I'm just going to put numbers in here wildly and show you that it pulls up uh, different uh, box titles. These are the same titles as here we would give, except I scrambled them and what I came up with obviously doesn't make any sense. So this is obviously not what I would enter. So what is it that I'm doing here? Where do these numbers come from? I have to go over here to the labels piece of my spreadsheet. And you have this also in your book in the case study section. And I'm going to show you where that is so you can take a look at it yourself. Case studies. We are on page uh, 278 in the book. Um, where this table starts. One is access services. You see I entered numbers one to nine, and that's what, what you're seeing here, one to nine. This list is alphabetical from A to Z here. So um, as to make this a little bit, I scrambled this a little bit and make it uh, a little more challenging to do as an exercise. So, so you can simply pick a noun that describes a high-level revenue cycle function. And there are, are uh, 36 possibilities here. And then enter those numbers here in this yellow section here and uh, relabel the boxes. So if I wanted to start with scheduling, not even sure where I see scheduling here. Scheduling is number 33. I would put 33 in here, and you see it would say scheduling. So that's how I would then go about uh, populating this chart. And then underneath that, I in this green section, I would put uh, the specific tasks that get performed under each of those nine boxes. And these are all uh, uh, tasks that I uh, define by using a verb. So they all start with a verb that denotes that this is a task rather than an overall function. And again, this list is alphabetized and goes uh, from A to Z. So if under uh, scheduling, let's say I, uh, I say one of my tasks is going to be to call patients put in a 10 here, and then it shows the task being to call patients. So you can build your own revenue cycle here as an exercise. Again, this is part of my effort to triangulate and to give you an opportunity to learn about the revenue cycle the best way I am able to, to present it to you. So that's uh, the end of process, and now we're going to move on and talk about um, payment systems. All right, and we're going to start by talking about the IPPS system on page 79 in your book. And to go along with that, there is a page here in the slides. Hey, Chris, this is Chris. Quick question. Yes, Chris. Um, just, just a clock reminder, we're about an hour and 10 minutes in, um, so don't lose track of our polling questions. 
Okay, very good. Um, let us do... Um, let I us may do not some think yet. Questions. I just want to keep a, a watch on the clock. Yes, okay, thank you. Well, not quite yet. We need to get a little bit farther uh, into this, okay? Okay. And we're doing fine on time. Okay, IPPS, here it is. Um, and uh, you can read about this on here. Uh, it is the payment system for paying acute care hospitals on a, a per discharge basis. Uh, prospectively, that's the P under uh, uh, the second P here in the name. The, the thing to know about it is that, and that's why I show you here on the bottom of uh, page 79 this geodetic marker, survey marker from the top of Mount Whitney at 14,000 and some feet. The entire payment system for Medicare takes its uh, bearing from a pair or a single a uh, 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 dollar amount. And this is the diagram that better than anything else explains how the inpatient prospective payment system works and you need to know this. You don't need to know what the percentages are, you don't need to know what the dollar amounts are, but you need to know the morphology of this picture. You need to know how the payment amount is calculated, what, what uh, happens here, what kind of what the boxes are. I guess I would say. So how does this work? The Federal Register every year publishes a standardized amount and a capital federal rate. The total of these two are kind of that geodetic marker, if you wish. Uh, this part here pays for operating expenses. This one pays for renting your, your uh, property, plant and equipment, your bed, your uh, laundry room, your cafeteria space. Uh, insofar as you are seeing or treating a Medicare inpatient. So you get $421 for every inpatient just as a rental fee or to pay for depreciation and, and use of your facility. The rest of it, the standardized amount, pays for everything else. And that amount is broken into a labor and a non-labor component. It's broken this way by uh, the, the lights of uh, some very smart people who looked at a lot of big data, be they at CMS or RAND Corp or MIT under contract for the government, someone figured out that labor costs are exactly 68.8% of total operating costs, the rest is non-labor. So you take this dollar amount, you split it in those two buckets, and then the labor piece of it, uh, undergoes an update uh, by multiplying it by the the um, wage index for the local area. It's it's uh, the local area is defined by a uh, classification system known as core based statistical area. You don't need to remember the name of it. Just so you know, there is a methodology for updating the labor piece and and uh, uh, acknowledge acknowledging that in Portland, Oregon, say, labor costs exceed the national average by about 10 and some per fraction percent. The non-labor costs are not uh, assumed to vary with uh, regionally or locally, so they are not updated. Together that gives you the payment rate for Portland. The capital federal rate undergoes a similar transformation. I call it a hard hat index. This is uh, construction costs and construction labor relating to a facility in the Pacific Northwest. These two amounts then added together, they're multiplied by, uh, by one, and, and uh, that gives you then the payment rate for a case of the fictional weight or case weight of 1.0. In this particular case, for in this example, for a particular DRG, I just pick one at random, MSDRG226, you multiply it out and you see what the payment in fiscal year 12 was. This is a little bit out of date, but it shows you what the methodology is. Now why is this on the exam and why are we going over this when computer systems do all of this for you uh, and you rely on others to figure this out for you? The answer is that it, it's 
um, it's just something that a, a well versed financial manager needs to know uh, how is this done even if you never have to do it yourself this is how from the federal registry from the geodetic marker essentially that uh, gives you these dollar amounts you would be able to figure out what the payment rate for a particular facility is that's just further described here there are some factors that have to do with uh, 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 you know whether you report quality information then there's some money taken away and then if you are in a in an area where the wage index is particularly low so it isn't over a one but it's less less than a 1.0 here as you know it's 1.1078 for hospitals where this labor index is lower the split between labor and non-labor is, is different and you don't need to know this just so so you understand why on this table here which comes from the Federal Register uh, it talks about here in table 1a hospitals with a wage index greater than 1 and down here other facilities with a wage index less than 1 so this is actually something straight out of the Federal Register and it shows you that if you report quality information or core measures and that is something else that happens in this box here so coders and medical records people here in this area not only code for purposes of getting paid but they also code for reporting quality information that is a process that is known as abstracting so if you hear the word abstracting uh, and want to know what the relationship between abstracting and coding is, abstracting basically takes information out of the record for measuring quality, coding takes information out of the record for, for payment. Uh, Christoph? Yes? We have a, um, we have a question um, that I want to put to you. So there's a question on the board that says, so will, will we have to calculate, will we be given the percentages, for instance, 68.8 versus 62, et cetera? So is there an expectation on the exam that they would need to do this type of calculation or be familiar with the background on how it works? Yes, the second. You don't have to. The, there's no calculation on the exam, period, when it comes to IPPS. Okay? Okay. But you need to know the, the structure of the payment system. Okay, thanks. Okay, and the only reason I get into this detail is to show you that there is more to know about it, and if you, if you ever found your way into the Federal Register, not that you ever really want to do that, this is what you would see. So that you can say, once in my lifetime, I've looked this stuff up in the Federal Register, kind of brag, brag and say, I did it, uh, uh, I know how this works. Okay, so here's a table that shows you what those geodetic marker amounts are. Then here's a table which shows you what the wage index is for labor and the hard hat index is. And here for Portland, you see these familiar numbers that you just saw in the, uh, the diagram I showed you a moment ago. And then here's a, to get a different table from the book which shows you for this uh, DRG226 what the weight is. It's a 6.7, so this is a fairly uh, resource-intensive uh, procedure, and you see even on this page where some others are listed, you know, it's a fairly highly weighted uh, 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 DRG at 6.7895. So that's how this works, and um, we are ready to move on to the next payment system and uh, the next one after that and then we'll do the polling questions because as I am looking at them I realize that that if we wanted to do them in order we really have to make it through the other payment systems. Okay. Uh, I have one question uh, before we move forward. Yes. So there's a question um, on the board um, that says in the exam um, what is the percentage of questions that do require calculation? So do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yes, I do. It's a good question, and I, I'm not sure I can answer that as a person. I'm going to have to take a stab at that here. There's 150 questions. Most of them are going to be narrative questions, not involving numbers. Uh, most of them will be, and in that sense, the actual exam is similar to the practice exam, the free practice exam that's on the HFMA website, and also the the 75 question exam at the end of the online uh, study guide from HFMA. In that sense, they are that uh, alike. Uh, I do know from my experience that I think I maybe mentioned that in webinar one. And again, last week, there were two or three data sets uh, of quantitative questions on ratios. And the data set is approximately, from my memory, is about five questions. So you get a, a, a table of numbers. You get five questions about that table of numbers. Uh, and that would be a data set. I, th I believe there are two or three of those data sets on uh, financial reporting. And on uh, the topics we covered last week, there are one or two. So, you know, at the very, at the, at the outside end, that would be uh, 25 questions out of 150, just on those quantitative topics. If you take uh, um, a some further questions from some of the other uh, modules to it, I would say maybe 30 or 35 questions would be number questions, and the rest would be uh, narrative questions. And I'm doing the best I can in, in trying to estimate this for you. So I would say that would be maybe 20% of the exam, 15 to 20% of the exam. Okay. Thanks for right. sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, moving on to the outpatient perspective of payment system. Uh, he, uh, here, too, uh, I don't think you have to break out your calculator. I'm pretty sure you don't. However, you do need to know how the payment system is structured and how it works. So let's dive into that here very quickly. Uh, there is a, a, a great deal of simplification built into the OPPS system because uh, the list of uh, CPT codes is pretty long. It's thousands and thousands of codes. And uh, uh, the OPPS system, like the uh, DRG IPPS system, has maybe 800 or so APCs. I'm not exactly sure of the number. and I'm, uh, It's actually very hard. <laughs> to find out how many APCs there are. Uh, so I, I, if you, any of you know, let me know, please. Share that information. I'll pass it on. So uh, there's some amount of aggregation taking place here. You see this right here on this table uh, where I list some examples of APCs on page 86 of your book. Notice that there are five levels up here. These are uh, visit codes. Um, there's been some change to this this year, but uh, it, it, uh, we don't need to worry about that right now. So there are five HICPICs or CPT codes that map to a level one clinic visit. And uh, that happens to be uh, APC 0604. Uh, there are seven codes that map to this one, and so forth and so on. Here is the the relative weight or the relative resource use or intensity associated with each of those levels. Um, and uh, some s s smart person figured all of this out. You see, in this case, there's 29 codes that map to a level 1 laparoscopy. But in some cases, like this one, a lithotripsy, it's just a single code. But look at the weight of that code, how resource intensive this code is or even this one, which is a replacement of a, a pacemaker pulse generator. Now, what is in accounting for this high weight, in part, is the cost of the device, which is built into this. So it's not like it takes a, a doctor uh, 93 times uh, uh, as much time to do this compared to a level uh, two hospital visit 
uh, uh, but that there is there are other costs that are um, grouped here and included. So there is the, this aggregation that takes place. Um, and uh, here is uh, here are the five codes, these five codes right here, up here, here that actually uh, uh, emerged into this 0604. There is a, a new patient visit as well as an established patient visit, level one, that um, are considered uh, to be resource equivalent and thus are paid at the same rate. But you see there are some other things that you wouldn't expect in this catalog that show up here as well. So these other three codes also have that same uh, resource consumption. And if you take the, the geodetic marker rate, and there is a geodetic marker associated with, uh, where is it? Here it is. There's a geodetic marker associated with this OPPS system, just as it is for the IPPS system. If you take that marker payment times this relative weight here, then you get these kinds of amounts. There's $48.18 uh, for all five of these codes. So there is some element of uh, uh, aggregation built into the OAPC or OPPS system. And you see what I'm saying here is there's about 500 APC groups. So this is the number I'm just not sure of whether this number is correct. So that's one aspect one characteristic of the OPPS system. The other is that some things are packaged. There's further aggregation here in that some things are not even paid. They are simply considered to be part and parcel of the APC and uh, are reimbursed at zero dollars. So they are, they show, if they show up on a bill, on a UB04, the, they are disregarded and ignored and not paid. And so what are some of those things? Routine supplies? anesthesia, operating and recovery, room use. In other words, you can't nickel and dime CMS and charge for all of these separately and think that you're going to get paid for them. Inexpensive drugs. Here are the devices, the expensive devices are put in there as well. And then as of January, also labs are packaged into APCs as well. I wouldn't think that you would be asked on that yet on the exam. All right, so that element of packaging or where certain things just don't get paid anymore but are paid at zero and here are some examples of them. That's one major feature uh, uh, of uh, the APC system in addition to this aggregation we talked about before, this packaging here. And then the second one, the second one is, is a system of discounting. What that means that if a doctor operates on, on your five toes on the right foot, the doctor and does surgery on them, and I'm making this up, uh, the first toe gets paid at 100%, and toes two, three, four, and five each get the surgery on them, each gets paid at 50%. So the thinking here is that when a doctor is performing multiple procedures, they shouldn't, it's not strictly additive how much the doctor gets paid. So the one with the highest relative weight gets paid at 100%. Everything else gets paid at a lesser amount. Back to the table here. And uh, these are the surgeries right here. These codes that have a T associated with them, status indicator. As the questioner just asked me, do we need to know the status indicator? I said no. So if a patient, poor patient, had all five of these procedures, this one right here, this, this uh, pacemaker uh, procedure would be paid at 100%. These other four, these right here, would each be paid at half. So that's what this multiple procedure discounting system is all about. OK, so you have just now learned in a very short time what the OPPS system is like. One last uh, uh, point to talk about is that there is an update to the national uh, geodetic rate uh, uh, here as well. And this update is uh, the same hospital wage index that we use on the OPP, IPPS side. It's the same 
wage index. So for a hospital in Oregon, if that's what we were talking about, it would be that same 1.1078 wage index. Except here the split isn't the 68.8 or whatever. It's a 60-40 it's a split between what is considered uh, labor costs on the OPPS side and non-labor costs, which are not adjusted. You multiply the one by, this, by the uh, hospital wage index and the 40% you pass through, you add them back together, then you get the hospital specific payment rate under OPPS. I give you then here an example of a patient that a poor woman who has all of these many things done to her and uh, you can figure out what the payment is, what the hospital would be paid, $4,021, out of which the uh, uh, Medicare would pay this, the patient would pay this amount. So that's uh, the OPPS system. Here's a, a sample OPPS claim. You can read and look at that on your own. There's more tables here how this calculation works, just to let you know that the conversion factor, that geodetic marker here for OPPS is about one one hundredth of an IPPS geodetic marker. If that was six thousand some dollars, this one is about seventy dollars. So you see how much smaller the numbers are on the outpatient side. Okay, then there is, uh, then we're ready now to move on to the Medicare physician fee schedule, and then we will do our polling questions, all of them together. Okay, what are we doing here on the Medicare physician fee schedule? First of all, let me tell you about uh, which system came first. The IPPS system came in 1983. It just celebrated its 30th birthday last year. Uh, the Medicare physician fee schedule has been around since 1992. And uh, that's the one we're about to talk about. And the OPPS system is the baby among the three. It started in August 2000. So let's talk about the Medicare physician fee schedule, what it is and how it works. It pays for all of these kinds of things. It's, it's the, the, phys the, the physician or a practitioner we're not talking now about what the hospital gets, we're talking about what the physician gets. So uh, where do physicians work? They work in all of these different settings and they get paid for providing their services in each of these settings. So uh, there are fees associated with hospital visits, clinic visits, ER visits, uh, surgeries, and these uh, payments don't depend on who it is performing it. In other words, if uh, a patient ha has a, a level one visit, and you remember the level one visit, or the, in this case, a e uh, emergency room visit, okay, in this uh, poor patient from Mossy Green Hospital in any town, Oregon, uh, with a level four visit, and here's the CPT or HICPIX code. It doesn't matter whether this doctor is board certified or not. It could even, let's say, which wouldn't happen in reality, it would be a neurosurgeon uh, stepping in and performing this kind of a visit at a 99285 would get paid the same regardless of training. So under this system, uh, it doesn't matter uh, who you are. If you perform a visit level E&M uh, evaluation and management visit level on a patient, you get paid the same regardless of what your credentials are, how many years your residency lasted. Now, that said, there are relative value units associated with uh, the things that you do. So, and those do incorporate training needed. Okay, so when it comes to determining what, uh, say, a neurosurgeon gets, there is an element of training built into that reimbursement because it's not something that anyone else would do. However, if that physician just did an office visit, the payment would not uh, be different for the neurosurgeon compared to, say, a family practice physician. 
This gets us already now into talking about relative value units. This is the system that came in 1992. Before that, physicians were paid by some other methodology, and I don't remember that far back what it was. It could have been a fee schedule-based system or a percent of charges system. I don't remember. In any case, in 1992, relative value units came into use, and relative value units measure inputs. They don't measure outputs. They don't measure how well a doctor made a patient, which is also not what the IPPS and OPPS systems measure, uh, uh, measure. They just measure inputs. And there are three different inputs into providing a physician service. And this is what the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, starting in 1992, was all about. The first of them is the our, our work our views. This is the labor, the, sh the, the sheer labor and time a physician puts into providing a service. It depends, and the magic words, I have them underlined here, so take good note of them, are time required, complexity, and training needed. That's how uh, a work RVU gets established. So someone goes around with a stopwatch and has figured out how long it takes for each of these services, uh, how long it takes a physician to provide them. But then there is a, a sort of a fuzzier, um, part to it called complexity, and I don't know exactly how that is measured. It has something to do maybe with the cognitive difficulty of diagnosis or, or treatment, uh, although I'm sure there are standards for that. And then there, there is this other element of training needed. In other words, residency, the length of residency does matter when it comes to figuring out uh, the RVUs for certain specialized services. So that's the first component, which uh, typically um, accounts for maybe half of the total relative value unit for a service, although it varies. Then there is a practice expense piece to it, which uh, covers for maintaining a practice. And the malpractice are views which essentially feed the lawyers and the attorneys, uh, and uh, these vary. Uh, can vary when they are regionally adjusted, can vary significantly across the United States. The geodetic marker for the MPFS system is, uh, here it is, is a conversion factor again. Uh, you see it is half the size of an outpatient conversion factor, which is about $70, and uh, no, one two hundredth of uh, an inpatient uh, uh, conversion factor or a standardized amount. So we're talking about even smaller numbers here. Here's how the calculation works. You take the work RVU, you multiply it by a, a, a labor cost, or physician labor cost index, specific to a doctor in a specific region. GPCI stands for Geographic practice cost index. Not, you don't have to remember this name. You do have to remember that there is such a thing and that you multiply the work RVU by that. So a doctor in uh, uh, Seattle would be paid differently from a doctor in Nashville depending on what the, the local labor market for a doctor of that specialty is. So there is some adjustment just on the doctor part. Practice expenses make sense also vary across the country because of, this is mainly labor costs, nurses and uh, uh, medical assistants and so forth. And uh, there is a, a, a separate index for that. And then malpractice has a third index. Each of these uh, uh, components, RVU components, are multiplied by their respective uh, index. You figure out the total RVU, you multiply that by the geodetic marker conversion factor and you come up with the Medicare physician fee schedule amount. Now in the real world uh, many doctors set their prices as a percent of this Medicare physician fee schedule payment amount, say at 200 percent or 250 percent or 175 percent. That is then what, uh, what you bill. Uh, Medicare, of course, doesn't pay that much. Other payers probably don't either. But you want to set it high enough that uh, you clear the hurdle of your uh, best paying 
payer so that you don't leave any money on the table. Then I have a little discussion here about the sustainable growth rate. You all hear about this once a year, and there's actually some hope this year that the issue gets away, goes away, and that doctors no longer get paid for how much they do, but also for, for the quality and the outcomes that they do. And here's a, here are the tables out of the Federal Register. You can download these also in Excel from the CMS website and figure out the RVUs yourself and then multiply them out by, by these <coughs> geographic indices here, the work index, practice expense index, that's what PE stands for, practice expense, or the malpractice uh, uh, inflator and look for Oregon, and this is an example for a hospital in Oregon, how low the, medic, the malpractice index is uh, compared to some other places in the country. So, so that's how this system works. <clears throat> We're ready to do some polling questions. So Brad, would you take it away please and show us polling question number one. Okay, so I, I am attempting polling question number one, and if I do this right, you should see it, and it should say CPT4 and Higgs big codes are used, please select one of the following. So we have about 15 more seconds before the poll closes, so if you haven't voted, please do so. Okay. We close the poll. And then I share. Bear with me since this is my first time. Um, you can see the poll results where 47% shows um, the third answer, CPT4 and Higgs Base codes are used for IPPS and OPPS billing, and 29%, which were the two highest answers, chose CPT4 and Higgs Peaks are used for OPPS and MPFS billing. So, Christoph, you're going to weigh in on that. Christoph, Sorry, <clears throat> I was clearing my throat and <laughs> turned my microphone off. Yeah. Okay. okay, let me start over again. Um, CPT and HIPPIX coding has nothing to do with IPPS. doesn't show up in IPPS at all. Uh, it does show up in the outpatient and in the Medicare physician fee schedule world. Okay, question number two, please, Chris, and I will not turn my microphone off again. Okay, question two. You should see visit and procedure codes are used. Please select one of the following.
So we have about 15 seconds before the poll closes. So it looks like Christoph answer C uh, got 59%. Visit and procedure codes are used for MPFS and OPPS billing. Yes. Thank you, Chris. That is the right answer. This is essentially a, just a restatement of the first question, if you will, because CPT and HICPIX codes are either visit codes or they are procedure codes. So it's essentially asking the same question again, and uh, they have nothing to do with the IPPS world. Thank you. Next question, please. The question number three. Okay. So you should see which of the following is true. Please select one. Okay, so we have about 15 seconds before the poll closes. Okay. So Christoph, the fourth answer max process both part A and B claims a task formally split received the highest number at 44 percent. Yes, and that is the right answer. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, participants. Um, Medicare administrative contractors uh, do the work that was formerly split uh, in the following way. They were fiscal intermediaries and they were carriers. Carriers just did the physician part just the physician uh, uh, reimbursement. The fiscal intermediaries did everything else. Um, why is A not the right answer and why is B not the right answer? We didn't really talk about this, although you will find this in the revenue cycle section of the study guide. Medicare A only pays for inpatient care. Doesn't pay for outpatient care. That's what Medicare B pays for, uh, both for outpatient care and uh, physicians is what's paid under B. Still, still nursing case, so a portion of B is right that it, Part B pays for office visits, but it is not true that B pays for skilled nursing care. That happens to be part of Medicare A. Uh, under provider-based billing, uh, talk about C, uh, we don't need to talk about it because no one or very few people thought that was the right answer, but it's actually not true. Under provider-based billing, hospital services are on a UB, physician services are billed on a 1500 form. Read about that in the Medicare Primer section in more detail if you're interested. Hey, Chris, in that case, take us please to question number four. Okay. So you should see which of the following statements is true. Please select one.
So about 15 more seconds before the poll closes. We have 63% for the first one, which is obviously the highest, but then we do have about 37% on the second line. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, audience. Uh, the PCS system, PCS stands for Procedure Coding System, so it is used for coding procedures, and it is only used for coding inpatient procedures. That's similar to how the ICD-9 system is used for procedure coding only for inpatients. Uh, the CM piece is the diagnosis piece, which is now clearly distinguished by its title from the procedure side, is used universally for in every environment, in and outpatient, but also in the, uh, the clinic or the physician office arena. It is used for all diagnosis coding. So that's why A is the right answer. Uh, what is wrong about answer B is that, that the PCS system uh, is not used for outpatient procedures, just for inpatient procedures. Let's do, by the way, uh, Brad is going to post the, this entire set of polling questions and answers on the Tennessee HFMA website and he, he also has, or maybe already has posted the polling questions from last week. So let's do the next polling question, Chris. Uh, okay. Polling question number five, an easy one. For you, okay. uh, so you should see which pitch. has been around the longest. Select one, IPPS, OPPS, or MPFS. We have about 15 seconds. Okay. All is closed. And Christophe, it looks like about 68% went with IPPS. Yes, and that is the right answer, 1983 for IPPS, 1992 for the physician fee schedule, uh, specifically the RVU system, uh, and OPPS right after the Y2K scare in August 2000. Moving on to question number six, please, Chris. Okay. All right. Which of the following is true? We have about 15 seconds before the poll closes. Okay, so we've closed the poll. And 
59 percent, highest percentage chose IPPS and OPPS follow the federal fiscal year, MPFS follows the calendar year. All right, thank you, Chris, and thank you for answering the question. This is something we haven't talked about specifically, so I don't blame you for uh, uh, how you answered. The actual the answer is B, that IPPS follows the fifth federal fiscal year starting in October. That's why the IPPS rule is the first to come out in, in as a proposed rule and then finalized about August for implementation October 1. And the uh, OPPS and the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule rules for, uh, uh, take effect January 1. And uh, that's why every year in January there's a lot of hand-wringing over whether the physician fees are going to be cut uh, to comply with the sustainable growth rate that's described in your book and that maybe will finally be solved called the dock fix, that is, as it is called, and OPPS uh, takes effect January 1 also, but there are quarterly updates to OPPS every three months. New codes are added, other codes are deleted. So there's a lot of activity, particularly in the OPPS world. Next question, please, Chris. So you should see, under OPPS, the following are bundled into APC. So we have about 15 seconds before the poll closes. Okay, poll is closed. And this stuff, it looks like all of the above got the highest percentage at 54%. All right. Well, I can see why uh, some of you might have thought that that's the right answer. I was looking for C, for supplies, and let me explain why. Radiology has its own APCs, so there is no bundling in that sense taking place. Bundling, remember, refers to adding certain uh, services from the catalog of CPT and uh, paying it at zero. So the um, so radiology isn't really a bundled service. It is a service itself subject to APCs. Uh, supplies, however, are bundled. In other words, uh, the um, Band-Aids and the, the little stuff is not paid. Uh, in that sense, CMS doesn't want to be nickel and dime for that stuff. Lab is not bundled except uh, uh, as of January for certain uh, uh, certain labs are now bundled. That's why I wrote non-ENM related there in parentheses. So I was looking for supplies as the answer here as something that is bundled. Okay, we have one more to go and we're, we're done with our polling questions for the day. Okay. So you should see modifiers are used for billing under Please select one of the following. About 15 seconds before the poll closes.
Okay, poll is closed. And the stuff it looks like about 59% chose OPPS and MPFS. Yes, that is the correct answer. Thank you, Chris. The reason it is the right answer is that modifiers apply to CPT codes and uh, their synonym C uh, HICPIX codes. And those are only used, those kinds of codes are only used in OPPS and Medicare Physician Fee Schedule billing. Uh, thus, A can't be the right answer, and uh, for that reason also C can't be the right answer. So thank you for participating in the poll. You've already answered uh, or had a chance to review the, the question nine here, which is a question that uh, didn't fit into the go-to webinar system. There were limited to eight questions. And then I have another one here, a coding question as well. You will see all of these posted on the Tennessee website shortly. What I want to do, though, uh, quickly also is to tell you that what you will see on the website are a number of replacement pages uh, that Brad is going to post and let me explain to you what they are and why they're there. Uh, I mentioned to you uh, the first week that HFMA has since published uh, its own list of uh, racial medians and so I added that to page 31. So you can replace page 31 in your book with this one that has this additional information on it. Uh, I also uh, asked Brad to post this page. This is page, you will remember this from last week, page 46. I made a few changes to it. I simply framed uh, these uh, um, words here up above and then at the bottom I entered uh, some information that wasn't there before. I'm giving you break-even revenue. And I'm also telling you here in this last box here how to calculate the contribution margin ratio percent two different ways. This way, which was in the book before, but also this way, which wasn't in the book before. So that's another uh, little improvement that I have made. And uh, then I want to show you another thing that I changed. And this is, uh, uh, I, I may have let you down the garden path here a little bit last week, and I realized it after the webinar. So I made a change here to page 53 by adding this note here on the bottom. So take a look at that and put that into your book as well. And then the last change that's coming your way is this embarrassing mistake that I made the first week where I had uh, given you the wrong information for calculating fixed assets financing. I still, I've, meanwhile, I figured out why that was. I, I was changing something in this spreadsheet and I accidentally updated an earlier version that contained this mistake. I didn't catch that, so my apologies for doing that. So you're going to have these various uh, updated pages uh, uh, to download and print and put into your book. Um, so it's up to date, and I'm giving you the, the very best I can. So we're at the end of yet another two-hour webinar. And uh, uh, thank you for being here today, and I look forward to meeting you again next week where we cover the last uh, uh, quarter of the class and then two weeks from now, same time, same place, a review session. Thank you and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Christoph. And, and again, for the participants, the uh, uh, website where all of this information will be posted is www.tnhfma.org slash chfp dash webinars and we've posted that in some of the chat boxes so you should be able to see that. We'll post the polling questions as well as the uh, uh, replacement pages and the videos uh, and we will get that um, um, out to everyone and everyone have a great day.